The problems of St James's as a historic area in central London are unique because it's such a well-protected area. It's an area that Londoners know and know it for its fame around the palace. But what was going wrong was the issue and local people in the area who, let's face it, are better than planners and planning authorities for knowing their patch, had been noticing that one of the development changes was old buildings of great quality for banking halls suddenly weren't needed anymore. It was one of those cycles of development where essentially they could build offices in other parts of the capital or reduce the number of offices. And big old beautifully finished banking halls could lend themselves to big restaurants and wine bars without much conversion and not much else that was economic in that period. So in the late 1980s, when London suddenly discovered it could have good restaurants and a good nighttime economy rivaling Paris and New York, Berlin and all the other world cities, it went over the top and the business cycle was looking for places outside the normal entertainment districts of London, Leicester Square, Covent Garden. And it hit upon St James's with these big banking hall buildings which were up for grabs. So local people got together and said, we're very concerned about this. This is an area of unique historic interest. And it's an area which effectively has a dignity, a calm, um, something which relates to the heritage it's had over 500 years of being close to one of the most ancient and important palaces. And we don't think it should be turned into a series of nightclubs and bars and restaurants and all the rowdy city life. And moreover, it's not necessary because there are other parts of London that already have it and are better suited to it. So what can we do? And they asked around a few people and they hit upon my name as an architect and town planner who worked in the city for a while, who looked at other areas like some of these competing areas, Covent Garden, other areas, Soho and Leicester Square, and asked for my opinion. Now I had thought a lot about the history of London and the heritage and its assets, particularly in Westminster, as I'd been an officer in the council for a while. And I recognised that along with councillors and officers like myself, we'd been complacent. It had been an area that, um, frankly, we'd got used to its high level of very historic buildings having the normal statutory protections and hadn't anticipated that buildings would be totally redundant as one use and therefore new uses might come in or that there were many buildings that could be knocked down and replaced. And so I said to the local uh, residents who got, had got together and business people who approached me, well what we need to do is reappraise this situation and get the attention of the local authority and the councillors and others like yourselves in order to make sure that that special character which is over and above normal planning policy is recognised. And you will know, everyone should know, that the history of St James's is a bit like the history of monarchy and religion and everything that's gone on in London, because it's right at the heart of royalty. It's got its own religious background. It dates back to the 11th century when the palace was actually the site of a leper hospital and then a religious institution. So those things, those fantastic characteristics that uh, we took for granted as professionals when we researched and looked in the dozens of books about St James's, uh, were not easy to put over to developers and their professional teams, architects and others, coming in from outside. So we did a summary, if you like, exercise of condensing the relevant design and background history of the area to get everyone on a kind of level playing field of knowledge and respect and an understanding that this just wasn't any old part of historic London. This is a very special part. And that's our argument, it's a special place. So the trust was formed out of these local people with their tool, which is this first document we produced, which we launched to the City Council and to English Heritage and to other local people, saying, look, we think there's a role for a body which is local, representative of business and residential knowledge and interests, 
And as a trust, we're a charitable organisation and voluntary, but we think we can help. We can help developers. We're not there to stop things if they don't need stopping. What we're there to do is to educate people. And so from 1999 until current 2016, the Trust has taken a role of education, information, promotion of the area and its special characteristics, and yes, protection and enhancement objectives, protection from the worst, and the aim always to get things that can be enhanced even better. Because the Trust is pro-development, but in the right targeted places and to the right standards of quality. Where the Trust needs to step in is to see that very important fabric or uses are not lost. And when a new building is proposed, demolishing an old building entirely, one needs to be assured that it will add to the area and not undermine the area. Now again, uh, there are policies about that sort of thing, but obviously the trust is not going to be in a position to completely design from scratch. So what it set out to do is to uh, put into documentation that people can use, a document called Architecture Suitable for St James's, for example, showed that an understanding of the grain and detail and craftsmanship of the past doesn't have to be replicated in every case. It can be a source of inspiration for an excellent modern building in the 21st century. But what we see is common to all the eras of development of the past of the best of the buildings in St James's is a degree of craftsmanship and intricacy, complexity if you like. Now, each of the eras had a different take on classical proportions or classical details or the attractions of brick over stone or different forms of stone or tile work or masonry. But all of them have in common an understanding of, of elegance and form and proportion and massing and height. So my job as an architect and town planner advising the trust when these proposals come in is to look at them carefully against the principles that the trustees and local people feel are sensible for the area. Approach a modern building next to or contacting or adapting an old building and see that really it's got a close understanding of the best of the existing fabric and its neighbours and its scale and its height and its bulk are respectful of those key features. And when it comes to what we like to see, which is a new excellence, an excellence of our age rather than a replication. And where those sites, limited as they are, are possible for development, that they understand that they will be contributing something which is, should be looking at a sort of heritage of the future in the same way as we look back into the past. Our aim is to not see St James's as an area as a museum. It's to see it as a, an area of renewal and improvement. And that's a pro-development stance. All we ask is that uh, before you get into a position of doing the wrong thing, often with the right level of money and possibly with the best of intentions, that we see it early in the process. And we've got 15 years now nearly of examples whereby if we are approached at the same early time that often developers will approach a planning authority uh, and are asked for our opinion and guidance, we will give the guidance in our opinion and avoid objection, blocking, conflict, irritation, you know, local campaigning, letters of objection, delays, additional costs and uncertainty to development. So in other words, if we can get a level playing field of information, an understanding, if it needs to be a negotiation between the good bits and the bad bits and our suggestions and recommendations, and they're looked at positively by the developer as well, which is our intention, then an all-win best solution can come out with no pain, no problem, and no objections and no delays and no uncertainties. Well, that's got to be the ideal way to manage development in a historic area. Back 15 years ago the trust didn't exist so even the local authority didn't really know that there were a few local people and their advisor trying to 
make things better. Having got ourselves uh, on their agenda and their cooperation, and it is a very good partnership now with the city council authorities and many, and in particular the principal landowners, they know we exist. They ask that developers contact us early in the process. Now, how can we be more expert than the experts that the council and the other authorities who have their normal powers and processes? Well, we take local knowledge and information and we put it forward in ways that we find are simpler, if you like, clearer than just using all the planning jargon that exists. Uh, so we get to the nub of issues, the key issues, the ones that mean most to local people in the area, the ones that have been learned through experience and observation. And that seems to be working quite well.